page 44. We're going to do a real quick recap. And in the middle of the recap, we're going to bring some clarity and detail, I hope. <clears throat> First off, you're on page 44. <clears throat> exactly. That's <laughs> in the envelope, please. Here we go. That's <clears throat> the... Um, so like we said last night, that's what, that's what everybody asked about Jesus. Who's the baby's father? That's what they said. Well, anyway. <clears throat> All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a new species that cannot be compared to anything that came before. Amen? You got that? <clears throat> Why? Well, because the new creation was made in the image of Christ, not the image of Adam. Adam was made in the image of God, but then he lost that image, so to speak. And then Christ had to return that image back to man. And the, the way that he returned it back to man was man had to come through Christ instead of through Adam. And now we are recreated in the image and likeness of God in purity, in spirit, in righteousness, and in true holiness, as the Bible says. <clears throat> Some of the attributes of the new creation are very simple. There's three main ones, and they pretty much encapsulate everything else. First off, old things are passed away. Right? That was a good chance to shout. <laughs> okay. right, Second, all things have become new. And third, all things are of God. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. What Pete, now I'm going to throw something in here we didn't talk about yesterday, but this is where it comes in at. What people call generational curses are not generational curses. Right? Generational curses, if you, even if you want to call them that, even the Bible doesn't call them that. <clears throat> but what people have taken to be that teaching uh, ended in Ezekiel 18. At that point, God told them, you will never say this again. And it wasn't until the church came up and with writing books and stuff to put in the bookstores that they came up with it and started bringing it back because they didn't have answers. And they weren't training people the way they were supposed to, so they had to go back to the Old Testament and find some reason as an excuse of why people could not be helped. And that's where that came from. So, what people call generational curses, as I said, are not generational curses. They are simply learned behaviors that bring undesired results. That's all it is. You live around somebody long enough, you pick up their habits. Okay? <clears throat> now, this is all you can... If you change behaviors, you change results. This is called renewing of the mind predominantly, but it's all sowing and reaping. That's all there is to it. <clears throat> so go home and throw out all those books you buy, volume one, two, and the blessings that, or the curses that stop the blessings and how to break the curses and all that stuff that you keep needing the next book because the last one didn't do it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> now, you are in God's witness protection program. Like we said yesterday, right? Your life is hid in Christ. Keep it there. Don't try to be somebody. Right? Just be Christ. If that's not a big enough somebody for you, you got problems. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, God had, now we're again recapping. God had a plan that He never revealed, even from beginning, from before the beginning of the foundation of the earth. Right? We read that yesterday. Now, if a plan is something, if somebody has a plan and it's not revealed, it's called a mystery, right? But a mystery is only a mystery until it's revealed. When it's revealed, it's no longer a mystery. Then it's just knowledge that can either be accepted or rejected. Well, y'all quiet. <laughs> y'all with me so far? <clears throat> it's no longer a mystery. It's not something God has hidden now. He has revealed it through his prophets and apostles to the church. And this mystery is now revealed, so it's no longer a mystery. Now it's just knowledge that you either accept or reject. And he said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And then he said, because you have rejected knowledge, then you'll be rejected, which is why people are destroyed. You get that? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it's no longer a mystery. It's been revealed. Jesus said that he had things to share that his followers couldn't bear. Now, again, I'm just recapping. We said all this yesterday, and you can find it all right there in the manual. He said he had things to share that his followers couldn't bear. He left this earth without sharing them. 
They couldn't bear them because they were not born again. Do you hear me? They were not born again. Okay. The carnal mind cannot discern spiritual things. They were carnal. If there was anybody carnal, it was that bunch he was running with. Right? I mean, wanted to call fire down from heaven and burn people up. And, you know, Peter takes a sword and lops off a guy's ear. I mean, he went, and he wasn't aiming for the ear. Right? The man moved. Okay? He's going to split his skull. That's a carnal bunch. Amen? Are you with me so far? Yeah. <clears throat> they were not born again. Now, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, after man was born again, or was able to be born again, and started being born again, then Jesus shared that mystery with the Apostle Paul. Paul said that had the princes of this world known the results of God's hidden plan, that mystery, they would not have crucified Christ. Isn't that right? So this plan was hidden. <clears throat> Jesus left with it, then he gave it to Paul. Paul revealed it. Now, if he said that they had, if they had known this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, then apparently the crucifixion had something to do with the plan. Right? But the plan was hidden until after the plan was completed, then it could be revealed because then nobody could do anything about it. Right? All this we said yesterday. <laughs> You're saying, if you can go through this that fast, why didn't you do this yesterday instead of taking all day? <laughs> now, so the mystery obviously has something to do with the death of Christ and its results. Not just the death of Christ, but its results. The mystery was hidden from before the foundation of the world. We read that. Jesus was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Isn't that right? Paul revealed the mystery for the first time in the history of the world. Now think about that. that like we said yesterday, that would be both an honor, but also at the same time a, a, an amazing... Um, responsibility <clears throat> very honestly <laughs> the way things have been for the last 2,000 years since then uh, it's almost the same thing now of, of saying the same thing how we are revealing yeah. this same mystery mm -hmm. right because it's still been hidden even though it's not been hidden it's just been forgotten it's never been brought forth so now he revealed it for the first time in the world. When it was revealed, it was no longer a mystery, which means something hidden. All, the word mystery, mysterion in the Greek, all it means is something hidden. That's all it means. So when something hidden is revealed, it's no longer hidden, so it's no longer a mystery. Right? Now, <clears throat> Jesus said, or I'm sorry, Paul said, that the only thing that matters is a new creation. Didn't we read that yesterday? Galatians 6.15. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but the new creation. And I will show you several times today where he said the exact same thing. Only the new creation matters over and over again. Now, <clears throat> this we didn't say yesterday, but I'm going to throw this in so you get a kind of an overall picture because there was a question about it too. So <clears throat> there are actually five compartments. This is going to sound like it's totally not connected. Okay? It is. <clears throat> there are five compartments... I could say were, technically. Uh, five compartments to the underworld. Right? If you go back and look, each one has a different place. Uh, Tartarus, Sheol, Hades, all these things. Uh, what, even what we call Abraham's bosom. And so there, there were different compartments. There were actually five of them that are listed in the Bible. I actually did a teaching on, on this one night at um, a church here in town when they asked me to speak. And it was uh, specifically, actually it was during Easter time, and they took each one of the sayings that Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. And instead of just getting up and talking about paradise being someday, I got up and went into to what paradise talked about in the Bible and explained to them that there were five compartments to the underworld, and you should have seen their faces. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to what the faces I'm looking at now. <laughs> in some ways. Um, <clears throat> but I could tell they'd never heard that before. But I went through and proved it. And what we want to realize here is this. There are five compartments in the underworld. One of them was called Abraham's bosom. That's where the righteous dead were held. Okay? The righteous dead, the saints of the Old Testament, they were righteous before God. They were not born again. You get it? Had they been born again, then when they died, they would have went to be with the Father as people are now. You get it? But they were not at that time. At that time... Why? Because Jesus' blood had not been poured out. 
the mercy seat had not been covered with the blood in heaven, which is what the Bible, Hebrews talks about. So none of that had been done. So man could not be saved the way that we know of it today. That's why it's so much better what the covenant we're in than the covenant they were in. Amen. Right? Now, <clears throat> so Abraham's bosom, that's where the righteous dead were held until Christ was crucified and then raised. Then when he was raised, he led captivity captive. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. It says he led captivity captive and led them with him. The captivity that he led captive were the saints of the Old Testament. That's who went with him. It said when he led captivity captive, he also gave gifts unto men. And then he named those gifts. And the gifts he gave unto men were actually men and women. And that were the what general people call the fivefold ministry. But actually it's apostles, prophets, and evangelists and pastors who are also teachers. So technically, there's, it's fourfold, not fivefold, technically, right? According to the Greek. Now, so he gave these, these gifts to the body of Christ, and that's what took place. So until Christ was born again, nobody was born again until then. Okay? No, the number one reason for that is if people could have been born again, there would have been no need for Jesus to die. Right? But there was still a need, and they were held until that time. Now, <clears throat> now we're going to kind of pick up where we were, but I want to say this. This is the hardest thing uh, for us at this point. Just because something is or has been a certain way doesn't mean that's the way it's supposed to be. But many times when you're in something for so long, you get so used to it, you assume. See, when I say church, most people still think four walls, building, go somewhere, right? which is not the New Testament idea of a church. Right? So, we, but we have been so indoctrinated through just years of being around that that now generally until you train yourself not to think that way, you will still picture that. So just because something is or has been a certain way doesn't mean that's the way it's supposed to be. Right? I'll give you another example. <clears throat> America is a constitutional republic, but it's not being ran that way. Right. And we're so used to the way it is ran or has been ran for so long that we don't know what a constitutional republic is supposed to be run like. And we think that's what this is. America is not a democracy. Right? A democracy means mob rule. That's what it means. The, the most numbers rule. That's not a democracy. We have a representative government. Well, supposedly representative. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> so, yeah, they're representing somebody. It might not be us. Anyway, <clears throat> so... Now, I'll throw one in here. African Americans won freedom a hundred years before they experienced it. Isn't that right? And things kept going the same way to a large degree the way it was before until somebody got fed up and started saying, we ain't putting up with this no more. And the amazing thing was, legally, according to the documents, they were free a hundred years before they were free, before they experienced it. Amen? Do you understand that? But at some point, somebody started looking at that and saying, you know what? This says I'm free, but I ain't seeing it. And I want to see it. And if I can't see it, my kids will see it. And they were willing to lay down their lives, and many died in the pursuit of the freedom that was guaranteed them through the laws of this country. Now, you are fellow citizens of heaven, right? You were strangers at one time. Ephesians, what is that, 2 8, something like that? I'm somewhere through there. 2 something. 2 6, something like that. <clears throat> but you were fellow citizens, or you were strangers. And it even says you were at one time strangers and foreigners to God. But now you are fellow citizens with God. So you have been, you're no longer estranged from God. Now you are with God, and now your citizenship technically is heaven. And therefore, you have to learn how to operate according to the rules and the laws of the kingdom of heaven, not according to the laws of church or religion. You get that? And those two things are vastly different. Now, <clears throat> it's, uh, we're not going to get over into that too much today, but I will tell you this. What we're talking about in this seminar with the new man when you're a citizen of another country and you get naturalized, you immigrate and you become a citizen of a second country, then you have to learn the rules and regulations, the laws 
the principles, the culture of the country you become a part of. And the minute you become a new citizen of a different country, technically, in the law, you become a new man. You're a different person. You're no longer this. Now you are this. You got that? You get a new passport. It, and, and basically, that passport says that you are the property, technically. The passport's definitely the property, but it also says that you belong to this country. And the reason that passport is so important is because another country cannot have authority over you or they have to answer to your home country first, right? <clears throat> That's why this, there's such a big deal about extradition from other countries, and there's a process. And if a person leaves the country and they get to a country, uh, if they're guilty of a crime or trying to run from accusation of a crime, they want to make sure they go to a country with no extradition. Amen? You understand that? Right? So you need to realize as a citizen of heaven, there's no extradition. You get that? You were translated from the power, authority of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And now you have diplomatic immunity. And matter of fact, the amazing thing is, it's amazing how much like Moses we are. We were guilty of some things, and we ran from one country just to get away from it, and we ran into the arms of God. And the first thing God did with Moses was send him back into the very country he ran from and said, now you have diplomatic immunity because you are my representative. You go back in there. And you notice he didn't go back in and face charges for murder. Remember, he ran because of a mur he murdered a man. And it's like that whole thing was just totally forgotten. And he went back in and then became an ambassador for God and ended up defeating the strongest army in history, up to that time at least, <clears throat> that was able, he was able to do that and bring out and birth an entire nation. Now, that is exactly what Jesus did, and it's exactly what we're called to do. Amen? You see that? We are called to be ambassadors. Our, a church, I, I'm telling you, everything is, uh, <clears throat> we, we can, we're in a good position because we can do what we need to do. We can change names of things. We can do these things. We can call them what we want to. But I'll tell you what, every, <clears throat> when you think, and, and I'm trying not to get over this too far real, <laughs> this morning, probably going to teach on this Sunday, as a matter of fact, because we're in a process of teaching on the kingdom. <clears throat> and, but it's real hard because these things are so interlinked. But you have to realize that every church is supposed to be an embassy that trains up diplomats for the kingdom of heaven, that sends out ambassadors into the world to represent the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> and that helps people be naturalized citizens of the kingdom of heaven to get them converted. That's the whole idea. And we don't, uh, the very word ecclesia, as I said yesterday, was it means to be called out, a called out group. But we don't even realize that even the Romans started using that at one point, And it was a good example. But the only thing we have, listen, you as a diplomat for the kingdom of heaven, you're not part of the of Congress of heaven. You're not part of the Congress of heaven. You don't make the laws. God made the laws. You're part of the cabinet. See the difference? You're not an elected official. The cabinet members are appointed. They're not elected, right? Because if it was an election, you wouldn't have been elected. <laughs> All right? Yeah, nobody would, well, nobody would elect you. There are people that are mad just because you're born again. Right? They're mad at you and won't even say you are born again. And yet, <clears throat> you are an ambassador. And you're a part of the cabinet of God. And as part of the cabinet, you're appointed by him to speak for him. And it's funny because <clears throat> the cabinet doesn't, it doesn't get elected in and basically can't be elected out. It can't be kicked out in that sense. But only the president, prime minister, king, whatever the chief official of a country is, they're the only ones that can technically uh, dismiss an ambassador. They're the only ones. Why? Because they weren't elected, they were appointed. And only the person that appointed them can disappoint them. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay? You get that? Now, so, <clears throat> as part of that cabinet, you ever notice the fastest way to no longer be a part of the cabinet is to say something different than the president above you says? Mm -hmm. If you disagree, you go across somewhere and you say, yeah, well, the president, he didn't know what he was talking about. You guess what? You're not going to be an ambassador alone. 
you're not going to be part of the cabinet very long. Why? Because the cabinet has to agree. <clears throat> well, whether it agrees or not, it has to say the same thing that their leader says. That's your job. Somebody asks you, well, you know, what, what, what's your personal opinion on, you know, homosexuality? Well, technically, I can't tell you my personal opinion, but I'll tell you what my king says. Why? Because I'm an ambassador. See that? So you don't have a right to your own opinion. You can only say what, what your king has said, the one who appointed you to be an ambassador. Amen? That, that, oh, that's what I'm saying. The, the church, the ecclesia, they called out uh, assembly. It's not a church in the sense that we think of it. It's not a place where people come together and where we just come in and have a quote-unquote service where we sing, pray, do these things. <clears throat> it is a place to come together to be trained how to be ambassadors to, and how to more effectively go into the world <clears throat> and present the kingdom of God accurately to the world, to be good ambassadors. That's what the purpose. Now, you say, how does this tie in with the new man? Because this new man is an ambassador. He is a, he, you have a new citizenship. You're a new creation. You're a new species. You've got a new passport. Your life is hid in Christ. The enemy has no claim on you. No right to say anything to you, right? There's no, the only reason he talks to you is because you listen. You say, well, that's not true. Yeah. yeah, he said, my sheep know my voice, and voice of another, they will not hear. See, you decide what you hear. Jesus said, take heed what you hear, because what you hear is how to be measured to you. So you need to decide what you're going to hear. All right? Now. Look at page 44. <clears throat> we're just going to run through these again to catch up where we were yesterday. And if you have a pen or something, you can even mark, <clears throat> just go through and mark it. And how many times it says the mystery. The very first one is right there in Romans 16, 25. <clears throat> now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of, the, of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. Circle mystery. Right? There's the first one. The mystery, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, <clears throat> but now is made manifest. Now, going down, go to the next page, top of the next page, page 45, verse 7. That is in, uh, yeah, 2 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. So now this Mystery is hidden wisdom. Then you go down to verse 12. You really don't see it again until verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. This has to do with this mystery that's been hidden, but now it's been revealed to us. And the, the mystery, now get this, part of this mystery that's being revealed has something to do with things that are freely given to us. So now this mystery has to do with the death and resurrection of Christ, but it also has to do with things that are provided for you. Amen? See how well taken care of you are? God took care of all this stuff in this mystery, kept it in there, and this mystery was not just for Christ and just for those three days there, but it was for you, and it's for now. Then he goes on. Let's go to the next page. Again, moving through here, and the next page. Yep. <clears throat> page 47, Ephesians 3, <clears throat> verse... We'll start in verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, or to me for you, how that by revelation, no man taught it to him, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, circle mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery. Circle knowledge and circle mystery again. Now notice what this mystery is of. It is the mystery of Christ. That you may understand his knowledge of the mystery of Christ. <clears throat> which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Now it's talking about what this mystery has to do with. And one, of these, one, one part of this mystery is that even the Gentiles can get saved. 
because uh, as you know from, as we said yesterday, uh, the Jews didn't believe that. They believed they could be proselytes, but, you know, that, they, but the, the definition of the word proselyte, basically according to the Jews, was I'll put up with you. <laughs> right? Pretty much that was it. Okay? <clears throat> then, he go on the next page. Look at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. In other words, how can you partake of this mystery? What part do you have in it? Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Notice where this mystery was kept. Hid in God, first off, right? Revealed in Christ, but hid in God, right? Now look, go down to <clears throat> Ephesians 5.22. Now we're going to read most of this, because this is kind of where we got to yesterday. We jumped ahead a little bit. <clears throat> but I want to read this to you. Verse 22, Wives, submit un yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. And that has been so overused in a wrong way, all right? Because it also says, husbands, you know, you're supposed to love your wives and submit one to another. To Basically, everybody's supposed to, to submit to everybody, right? And, and you're supposed to do that out of love and respect for one another and to show the love of Christ to every person like that. And so here he is... He's, he's showing this, but the reason he said, you have to realize, people, for some reason, people don't read enough. They just read this first sentence. And I don't know how many times I've been in churches, different churches, and man, they'll pound on this one. You know, wives submit to your husbands, right? And they don't even say the whole verse there because it doesn't say wives submit to your husbands. It says wives submit to your own husbands, right? <clears throat> we had a situation in Bible school when I was in Denver. Had... Families come in in the Bible school. Now, you would think if people come to Bible school, there'd be a certain level of spiritual maturity. <clears throat> Wrong. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we had some guy, that husband and wife, and they got mad at something some guy's wife said, and, and these are all Bible school students. So this guy went to this other guy's wife and started just, you know, just chewing her out, just, you know, in a hallway. And then we went back into session, and then they started talking. And the wife told the husband, he was just getting on to me in the hallway, and he said this to me. And, said, and so the next break, these two guys go out on the front porch, <laughs> start to square off. And I'm in there preaching, and I hear these guys out on the front, and I'm thinking, Where? okay, these two husbands are gone, and I, I had an idea something was going on, wasn't sure what it was. Now, they're not in class. And the class wasn't real big. We had, I don't know, 15, 16 people there. And, you know, you miss two of them, you miss them. You know, if two people are gone out of 16, you, you notice they're gone. And I started hearing the voices get louder, and my son goes out, and then another person goes out, and pretty soon there's more people outside than there are inside. <laughs> you know, because everybody's, everybody's gathering around, they were fixing to see the fight, and everybody's trying to calm them all down. And I'm thinking, and all this is going on, if you watch the uh, DBI videos, you can tell. I, I'm like, <laughs> kill them all, God, we'll start all over again. You know? <laughs> and I was like... We'll we just be Moses, you know, just, just burn them all up and we'll do it, you know, <clears throat> the reverse Moses effect. But anyway, so <clears throat> we, um, but it, it's just amazing how, <laughs> how Christians can act, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> so, but it is because that man didn't have a right to go to that other man's wife. Should have went, he, if he's going to talk to anything about it, they both should have been there and they should have discussed it with the, both of them there. He shouldn't have cornered some guy's wife off in a corner. You corner my wife off in a corner, I'm going to be right in the middle of you, right? You don't have a right, you get, especially if you're going to be going after her on something because you ain't got that right, right? And technically, I don't even have that right if I love her. You understand? The way, the way Christ loved the church. Now, there, there's correction, of course there is, all that stuff, but <clears throat> nobody has the right to get in there. That's when you step in the middle and say, no, you don't. No, you don't talk that way. Amen? Amen. So, he says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? Verse 26, that he might sanctify, separate, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. If you go in and study, you'll find out that spot and wrinkles are people. They're people, 
All right? So ought men to love their wives <clears throat> as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now, most people take this passage, and when they preach on it, they only preach on the first few verses. And they talk about submission, 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 and they try to hammer that. And the whole purpose of this passage was not about wives submitting. Right? The purpose of the passage was to show, and Paul clearly says this, he says in verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Here's why Paul wrote this whole verse, or this whole passage. The next one, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He wasn't even focusing this on human relationships. He's trying to show how the church and Christ are no longer two, but one. You get that? He's showing how they are made one. Now, he used, and he said, listen, he said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I'm using husbands and wives as an example because the two are supposed to become one. <clears throat> that means in direction, in, objection, uh, in objectives, in what they're going after, in, what, in, their, in their path in this world. <clears throat> and you are supposed to be able to become one in the sense where the wife can say what the husband would want said and the husband can say what the wife would want said. In other words, they know the mind of one another. Isn't that right? I mean, come on, husbands, wives, how many times have you started saying a sentence and your wife or your husband finish it for you? Right? And the longer you've been together, the more they can finish a sentence. And you know what I mean. After a while, you've been together so long, you can't even get a word in edgewise. No, anyway. no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> they just say the whole sentence for you. No. <clears throat> no, but you should be of one mind. Amen? You should be of one mind together. You should be able, they, they should know and be able to say what you would say. And so it, it's, a, it's the same thing with the church. We should be one together. It shouldn't be a question about what Jesus would think or feel about a situation. We shouldn't even hesitate. Right. Yeah, it's just like the example I gave the other day, that uh, <clears throat> my Shauna was talking to my daughter Rebecca about. The, and I told you about this. I think yesterday, where the, this guy said, "I want to come from somewhere, Australia, somewhere." He said, "I just want to come over." And I think Shauna said, "You know, what, 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 what should we tell this guy?" And Becky said, "Well, I know what my dad would say. Just tell him to come on." And then <clears throat> later, Shauna came to me and said, "What?" Uh, Here's a situation. What do we tell this guy? I said, tell him to come on. And she goes, that's exactly what Becky said you would say. Well, why? Because she knows me, right? She didn't have to ask me. She knows what I would say. She's been around me enough. She knows my mind. She knows uh, how, how I think about things concerning ministry and people and these things. You know, she didn't even have to ask. You get that? That's the way we're supposed to be. That's the way the church is supposed to be. It shouldn't be, well, what do you think about it? Well, hang on, let me go check. Let me go see. Let me go fast and pray three days and see what I hear from God. It, sure, it ought to just be right out. And I mean, even if there was no other reason than just for the fact that he said when you stand before people, you open your mouth and be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you, you ought to be able to do it that way. All right? You ought to be able to do it by the Spirit if you can't do it by the mind of Christ working through your mind. But if you have your mind renewed, then you can work by the mind of Christ. And it doesn't even have to be technically the Spirit working through you at that time with a gift. It's just your mind is renewed to the mind of Christ and you work together. You're one. Amen? Because you have the same objectives. You have the same desires. You have the same goals. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a union between, and I say the church, and I don't even want to say that because then it's always somebody else. You know, it's always the group as a group, but it's not just a group. It's individually. He that believeth shall do the same works. He, not they. Right? It's not as a group. Every individual believer should be able to do the same works and greater. Amen. Well, you can't do that if you don't have the same equipment and the same mind. So that mind, of, he said, let this mind that was in Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That's the mind you're supposed to have. He said, we have the mind of Christ. So what does that mean? That means we think with clarity. That means we think soberly. It means we think accurately. We, we think scripturally. That's what he's talking about. There's this whole thing that the church has been kept as babies so long because, very honestly, insecure people who want to make sure that they have a job so they never want you to grow up, you know? You ever see, well, mothers and fathers, 
you know, it's always kind of played up about the women not wanting to let go of the children when they go off to college or when they go somewhere and move out of the house. But, uh, husband, you know, fathers are the same way. They just generally don't show it as much. But at some point, you've got to learn. And if you're going to be a, <clears throat> a minister of the gospel, you've got to grow people up and let them go. You can't, keep, you can't keep them in bondage and keep them at a certain level just so you have a job and so you feel needed. You know, if anything, grow them up, get them out, and get a new group. Amen? It's not about keeping somebody at a certain level so that you can stay above them or stay in charge of them or stay needed. You, you've got to realize we have a job to do. You know, you're not, you're not supposed to be a nursery attendant. You're supposed to be a drill instructor. I mean, that trains people up and gets them out. Do, do, train them the best, just like you do your kids. Teach them, but at some point you have to believe that what you taught them, they have actually right. brought in and that they can walk it out. You have to trust them, right? You have to trust them the fact that God has given you the ability to train and they can actually go do it, right? So, <clears throat> let's move on. So there in verse 32, you circle a great mystery. Then in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, He's talking about being prayed for. He says, and pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the good news. You hear that? Now think about that. The mystery of the gospel. How can there be a mystery of the gospel? I mean, the gospel, we're out there preaching the gospel. How's there a mystery in the gospel? It's because it's not... <clears throat> Listen, the gospel is not... I'm going to say something here again. Um... The gospel is not just, and I say this with all reverence, okay? It is not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Right. Okay? And Jesus did not go around preaching his death, burial, and resurrection. He went around preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So now we talk about now his death, burial, and resurrection give us the door into the gospel of the kingdom. It gives us the door into the kingdom of God. And so we, we lift that up. We, we acknowledge that. We acknowledge what he did, and we acknowledge what he's doing to us. But you can, you're not giving due reverence to what he did if you don't take it further with what he did through you. Right? He didn't just die to get you saved. You get that? He didn't just die... Or he didn't die just to get you saved. He died so that you can change. He, he was resurrected so that you could be birthed in him and so that he could reproduce himself in you. Listen, he does not want sa sinners saved by grace. He wants the righteousness of God in Christ walking this earth. Amen. You understand that? Now, both are important. Both are aspects of it. But at some point, you have to walk. See, he is the door. But you don't just come to him. He's the door to what? To the Father on into. We have boldness with access, with confidence, right? He's the door that lets us walk into the Father. We don't just come to the door. You don't just come to somebody's door and stand outside and say, well, I'm at the door. There's the door. Open the door. Okay, I stepped inside the door. Oh, that's pretty. Let's look around that way. Well, why don't you come on in? No, I'm, I'm, I'm in the door. That's all that counts. <laughs> no, this whole thing now is yours. Why? Because little children, it's the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen? It's all yours. Don't just go in the door. Go on through. There was a question yesterday about, you know, if Christ is uh, birthed in us and we're born again, we have his spirit, we're born of the spirit, then why do we need the baptism of the spirit? It is an endowment of power. You get born again, he is within you, and you have what you need to exist. You have what you need to get uh, whatever your needs are met. And you can even believe for other needs. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to make you like Jesus in every way. You get that? You're made like him in spirit through the new birth. But you get to act like him by the baptism in the spirit. You notice Jesus didn't do any miracles before he was baptized by the spirit in the river Jordan. Isn't that right? So if it was good enough for him, good enough for you. Amen. If he needed it, you need it. Come on. Come on. Amen? Yes, sir. He didn't do anything till then. And you think, well, it, it, man, it's awesome when you get baptized in the Spirit. Yeah, because right after that comes great temptation and great <laughs> out in the wilderness. <laughs> Amen. That's when, the, that's when the devil says, let's see what you got. Right? 
And then, but the bad part is most people never come out of that. Yeah. They never move on. And it says when he came, when he returned from the wilderness, he returned in the power of the Spirit. Most people never get that. They never return in the power of the Spirit. So, now, he says, <clears throat> that I may make, to make known, verse 19, the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. In Colossians 1.25, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, circle mystery, which has been hid, hath, past tense, hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now. You hear that? Yeah. Hath been hid. What's the next word? But. What does that mean? That's no longer true. Now something else is true. Isn't it right? And then what you learn from the DHD? When you see the word but, it means forget the first part and focus on the next part. Right? Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Now this mystery is made manifest. Well, guess what? If it's a mystery made manifest, it's longer, no longer a mystery. Because mystery means hidden. It's no longer hidden. Now it's made manifest. Now it's the revealed. Hence the term revelation. Right? When, something, when there's a revelation of something, it is something that is revealed. Now, verse 27. To whom God... Now he's talking about the saints... To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Now notice there, he's talking about this mystery. And he says, God's going to, this, this thing has been hidden, but now it's revealed. And now God is going to make the glory, the riches of the glory of this mystery known to the Gentiles. Uh, he's he's, he's going to be open to the Gentiles also. Now watch what this mystery is. Here it is. Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Now, I don't want this to be anticlimactic, okay? But I want you to realize everything we have said so far from yesterday morning really up to this point has led to this. This is what makes the difference. Amen. This is the mystery. This is why, now think about this. This is why had the princes of this world known they wouldn't have crucified Christ. I mean, if, if they'd have really known what was going to happen, that, it was, that Christ was going to be able to dwell within men, they wouldn't have killed him. They would have said, hey, it's a lot better to deal with one than it is with millions. You know, right? So we'd just left him alone. I mean, sooner or later, you know, he, maybe his fame would have you know, died down or something, but at least we wouldn't have had to deal with all of them. Right? Yeah, but the devil has also found a good way not to deal with all of them. Because even though this has been revealed, the church never picked it up and ran with it. And every time the church tries to do it, somebody starts yelling heresy or starts yelling something else because somebody gets off somewhere and starts trying to be the big, uh, you know, the <laughs> Protestant pope. <laughs> okay. And they start trying to say, you know, uh, I, I, I'm somebody great because I understand this and you don't, and, and then they have levels of understanding and oh, yeah. all this kind of stuff, and, you know, I have this revelation, so it makes me special, so, you know, kiss my ring and I'll, I'll bless you. <laughs> all right? And we have to realize the, the, this mystery, the mystery, it is amazing, the mystery was not something else. The mystery was simply Christ in you. The hope of glory. That was the mystery. That was hidden from before the foundation. See, because nobody in the Old Testament knew this. And, and even when God would speak through them, they would say things lending toward this, and they didn't even get it. They didn't even understand even what they were saying because they were saying it by the spirit of prophecy, and you don't always understand your, what you're saying when you say it by the spirit of prophecy. You're just saying what you hear. And yet, he was, this whole thing, they didn't understand how a man could be born again. They understood how an anointing, as we would say, it would come upon a man. They understood how the Holy Spirit could move upon a person to write scripture or to give a prophecy or to speak for God or to do a mighty work or a mighty miracle. They, could, they understood that. that was, do you get that? There was no mystery to that. There was no mystery to what we call the anointing, to uh, passing what people call mantles today, which is not a New Testament term by any stretch. But there was no mystery to that. They understand. They understood that. Even, you know, Elisha, 
Elijah goes walking by and he takes his coat off and throws it over to Elisha and Elisha comes running after him. And he says, what's the, what's the deal here? You know, what are you doing? And Elijah looks and says, what have I got to do with you? Uh, hello, I was minding my own business. You started this. You know, you drew my attention to you and I, I want you. And he said, well, if you stay with me, ask what you want. He said, well, ask what you want and you'll have it. He said, I want a double portion of what you got. He said, if you see me when I go, then you can have it. Now, think about it. There was no mystery. It was real simple. You want the double portion? You want the anointing like he had and even, even more? It's real simple. Stay with me. See me when I go. Stay, in other words, don't leave before you get it. Stay with me till I go. When I go, you'll pick it up. You know, we always say that, that he was taken away, uh, that Elijah was taken away in a whirlwind. He wasn't taken away in a whirlwind. It, yeah, chariot show, and, and I guarantee you, they, they appeared b between him and Elisha. They were a distraction to see if he'd get his eyes off of seeing him when he went. Because if he'd got his eyes off, he wouldn't have got it. Even in the midst of all that, he wouldn't have got it. He had to keep his eyes on Elijah. Because he said, if you see me when I go. So that was the whole point. That was the last test Elisha had to pass. And so there was no mystery to this. So here, but the mystery was very simply this. How? Could God change a man? Can a leopard change his spots? Can, can wool that's scarlet with sin be made white and pure? How could that happen? That's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah, with, with man it is, but with God it's not. And they did not understand. It was an absolute mystery how God could move into a human and literally change them to be something they were not before and to be this new creation that nobody even understood. I mean, people, men were just men. Yeah. Do you realize you're no longer just a man or just a woman? Nowhere in the Bible are you told to walk, literally, as men. Matter of fact, every time it mentions it, it puts it down. Almost like, don't do that. He even said, why, why would you walk as mere men? Why? We said, well, if we're not supposed to walk as men, what are we supposed to walk like? Sons of God. That's what he said. That we're to be, to be, to be sons of God, holding forth the word of life. That we are different. We're not just human anymore. We are sons of the living God. Do you understand that? Amen. That's a new species, a new creature. And the only thing we have to go by, it's not Paul. It's not Peter. It's not the sons of thunder. Right? They were not born again at that point. The only example we have, the only perfect example, is looking unto Jesus. Amen. Looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Isn't that right? You must look unto him. He is your only example. The way he did things, the way he acted, the way he treated people. And you have to remember, we are in exactly the same situation he's in, or was in when he was here. He was a son of God walking in a fallen world around people that didn't have a clue about what God was trying to do. And he was dealing with fallen men, fallen people that were carnally minded. That's exactly the position we're in today. Isn't that right? Our job is somehow, now think about this, the carnal mind cannot receive the things of the Spirit. And yet we've got to convince them to let God change them by the Spirit. We've got to convince them to do something that they cannot understand what they're doing. Do you get that? Yeah. That's why it's called faith. Why? Because Abraham had to leave where he was at and go to a place that he didn't even know where he was going. Why? And God called that faith. Because Abraham did something he didn't even know what he was doing. And that's why it takes faith to get into the kingdom of God because we have to convince people to let God change them and they're doing something that they don't even know the results of what they're doing. They have no clue. They just think, get saved, avoid hell. Sounds like a good deal. We can do that. You know? and, and the bad part is we have watered that down where we don't even have all of that in play. Now it's just Jesus' fire insurance. Let me tell you, he was not raised as the you know, great and first fire marshal. You get that? He was raised as Lord. Somebody you bow your knee to and that you say, I will do what you say. And then he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Yeah. Isn't that right? Amen. That's right? And yet we have a whole thing going on right now in the church. Oh, you don't have to do what he said. You don't have to do any of that stuff. It's all done. Just kick back and be whatever you want to be. Do anything you want to do. It doesn't matter anymore. No. He said, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I say to do? 
People say, are you, are you saying we should keep the law? I'm telling you, you should keep the law. Yes, I am. You know what law? The royal law of love. You should keep that law. You should love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You get that? If you do that, you ain't going to worry about any other law out there because you won't violate any of them. Right? And that's how you are saved. You're saved from sin, saved from violating those laws. Why? Because you love. Isn't that simple? Easiest thing in the world. Two, you have to deal with people. <laughs> okay? So, one little thing there. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back in just a few minutes to pick this back up.